All right. So we are all set to get started. We're so excited to have you join us this evening. We are really looking forward to hearing from Dr. Jackie Gutman and Victoria Dean about what it can look like to achieve pregnancy using donor sperm and how there's different paths within that option. And we're really looking forward to giving you the information to have agency in the process. So as you might have noticed, I did start a recording. We are gonna record this initial presentation component of the evening, but I will turn it off later for questions. Um, if you have any more sensitive questions you're not comfortable asking on the recording. So with that, I will pass it off to Dr. Jackie Gutman from RMA to get us started. Great, Phoebe, thank you very much. Um, what, what we're both gonna talk about is again, achieving pregnancy using donor sperm and sort of some of the different approaches. Um, I have slides, that being said, we are a super small group and so what I would say is, please, if you have any questions, um, don't hesitate, at least while I'm speaking, to shout them out. You can put them in the chat as well, however you want to do it, whatever is going to be uh, most comfortable for you. Um, all right, so that's screen two. And I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully, what you're seeing is a big fat slide that says achieving pregnancy with donor sperm. Is that right? Cool. Yep. Okay. So ultimately to, to be able to make a baby, which is really what we are talking about, there are building blocks that are required. And so you need to have, at least in 2022, you need to have eggs. And that's a picture of, come here little guy. That's a picture of an egg right here. You do need to have sperm um, and ultimately they come together to make an embryo. This is what a beautiful embryo would look like in the IVF laboratory, but this is actually what an embryo would look like um, inside somebody's uterus as well. And then you absolutely need a uterus for an embryo to essentially implant and, and grow. Um, and depending on how it is that you're trying to get pregnant, uh, fallopian tubes are, are definitely a big plus. And ultimately, you put all of those things together, and the hope obviously is that it results in a, in a successful, healthy, ongoing pregnancy and baby. So I know you spent last week, I think it was last week, talking about selecting a sperm donor. I'm going to blow through this pretty quickly, um, but again, you know, certainly stop me along the way. It may have been that you got enough information last week to just make you have more questions, so don't hesitate. So essentially there, there are two major kinds of donors. There are those that are anonymous to you, not known to you, and those that are known to you, and they can be called designated or directed. Um, and so you get anonymous sperm from a commercial sperm bank. And I think somebody from the sperm bank from Fairfax uh, was with you last time, if any of you were here last time. Um, and then you can have a directed uh, donor as well. In terms of, um, Don, uh, donor sperm, and this holds true for donor eggs, donor embryos, um, the FDA unfortunately plays a role in what we do. Um, it makes it more labor intensive, it makes it a little bit more complicated, it makes it more expensive, but it is what it is. They, they essentially uh, put a rule in place back in 2005. Whether you are, if you're, if you're working in a doctor's office and, and, and you know, Victoria and I will make distinctions between that, but if you're working in a doctor's office, we must follow FDA guidelines. And these guidelines essentially deal with how the donor, in this case, we're talking about sperm, how the donor gets screened. Um, they have a special kind of history. They have bloods um, that need to be done. They have cultures that need to be done. There's a physical exam that needs to be done. It needs to be done within a certain time frame of providing a semen sample. Even though you might think, gee, you know, I know this guy and I don't really need to do any of that. The bottom line is, unfortunately, do you need to do that? Well, we need to do that. Otherwise, we get, you know, punished by the FDA. So even if it's somebody that you know, 
assuming you are not sexually intimate. And the FDA doesn't exactly define what sexual intimacy is, but as long as you're not sexually intimate, they must be screened. If the donor is anonymous, it, the sperm has to be quarantined for at least six months and then the, the donor gets rescreened. Different practices will have different policies about quarantining. In terms of the sperm banks, they have different kinds of sperm as well. Um, they have essentially uh, identity release and different banks will call it different things, but where the donor is willing to be um, contacted when the kid is 18 um, or totally and completely anonymous. Now, I think we would all agree, and this is a little girl down in the corner who said, haven't figured out the right words for this, but it looks like we share a significant amount of DNA. At this point in time, anonymity is a thing that has likely gone out of the out the window between Facebook and, and those kinds of things, general internet, and then 23andMe, Ancestry, all of, all of those kinds of things. Um, not so much anonymity anymore. So when you're selecting, those are one of the things to select for if you are using a sperm bank. Characteristics, tall, less tall, dark hair, light hair, blue eyes, brown eyes, plays the violin, doesn't. Um, the donors also will get genetic testing done. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, and they are screened for something called CMV. And again, if you were here previously, I, I imagine they talked about CMV where um, it is a virus that is extraordinarily, extraordinarily, extraordinarily common. More than half of us have been exposed at some point in time in the past. But if you were to get it when you're pregnant, it can cause pretty horrible things in a developing fetus. So it can cause developmental delay, blindness, deafness, death. I mean, it really is, is pretty yucky. So, so the donors do get screened for uh, CMV, as do recipients. Um, in our practice. And if somebody is CMV negative, if, a, if a, a patient is CMV negative, we encourage them to get CMV negative sperm. If you're, work, if you're using sperm from somebody you know, there are a whole lot of different options there as well. It can be your best friend. Um, it could be somebody that you're going to co-parent with. It could be your partner's brother. So many different options. So when we think about the ingredients, right, we, we, we know that you need to have sperm. And, and again, that's where a lot of the focus is going to be today. You need eggs, you need a uterus and you need tubes. So there's the sperm part and then there's the other part. And so when we think about the other part, we want to be able to get a history. And this holds true for really anybody who is thinking of building their family, right? This is not just for people who are, donor, who are using donor sperm. So one of the things that we know is, unfortunately, we as women are born with all of the eggs we will ever have. And I would argue, sadly, we use our best eggs up first. So we have all of these eggs and then, you know, fewer and fewer and fewer. By the time we enter puberty, we've actually used up more than half of our eggs. Now, this was super efficient, I guess, when you were, you know, eaten by a woolly mammoth or something at the age of 22, but it's not particularly efficient today, but, but it is still the case. And so ultimately what we then see is that the likelihood of getting pregnant within, in this case, six months is significantly greater if you're in your 20s than if you are in your 30s or into your 40s. So age plays a role, and we obviously want to, to determine that. We want to get a regular OBGYN history. Regular periods, not regular periods, painful periods, not painful periods, any history of a pelvic infection or fibroids or cysts or endometriosis. Has somebody been pregnant before, and did they have any problems with pregnancy? We want to know about any medical problems that they may have that may complicate a pregnancy, any surgeries that they may have that may make it more difficult to get pregnant. Are they taking any medications, medications that shouldn't be taken during pregnancy? And ultimately they need to be taking vitamins to increase the likelihood of a healthy pregnancy. And then we also ask for family history. Is there anything we need to worry about from a genetic standpoint that could be passed on? Again, no different whether you're using donor sperm than whether you're using sperm from a partner. 
we ask about social history. So somebody smoking, smoking is bad for sperm, certainly. And that's that cute little picture here. But smoking actually decreases the likelihood of being able to get pregnant. Alcohol consumption in excess can decrease the likelihood of being able to get pregnant. Caffeine is a little less clear, but there is some, some data that suggests a lot of caffeine, you know, three, four, five, six cups a day may be associated with an increased risk of miscarriage. Less data with, with uh, marijuana or other rec rec that, recreational drugs. We want to know that, that somebody is otherwise healthy. So, you know, regular visit to the, the gynecologist, or, are there any fibroids on exam, any cysts on exam, everything else looking good. And then we typically will get what we call a conception panel. This is usually blood work that's gotten when somebody is already early pregnant. But we think it makes a lot of sense to be able to do this before somebody is pregnant. So for example, we look to see if somebody's immune to German measles or chicken pox. If you're not, we recommend getting vaccinated. If this is done in early pregnancy, you can't get vaccinated for those things in early pregnancy. And so you wait till after you're pregnant so that maybe there's a little increased risk there. We check for CMV as we talked about. Um, we check to make sure thyroid gland is okay. And we offer um, genetic testing. And at a very minimum, we recommend that people get screened for something called cystic fibrosis and something called spinal muscular atrophy. There are also panels that screen for hundreds of different disorders that we offer to patients. And if you're getting sperm from a commercial sperm bank, again, most of those, the commercial sperm banks will do that screening. The majority of those disorders are autosomal recessive disorders. So essentially, we're going to pretend that the purple is the disease. In this case, it's a kidney disease. And the green is no disease. So the, this individual has, the egg source has uh, one gene that's not normal and one gene that is, and the sperm source has the same. And so essentially they have a 25% chance, wrong color, 25% chance of having a child with that disease. And so those are the things, again, that we talk about even before getting started with treatment. And so once all of that stuff is done, we're ready to move on to helping. And I think the other stuff is a help too, but helping you try and achieve a pregnancy with donor sperm. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Victoria. So I'm going to stop my sharing and I'm going to mute myself. Hi, everybody. My name is Victoria. Um, I'm a certified professional midwife and I've been doing this for almost six years. I've been doing fertility care for about a year and a half. Um, previously, I was working in a state where it was explicit in my licensure that I could not do fertility care. So it's been really exciting to be in this state that doesn't regulate me in the same way so I can do this kind of care. Um, I work with Refuge Midwifery with Ray Racklin. We are a queer owned and operated midwifery practice. We primarily do home birth, but we also do IUIs and preconception counseling for queer families and single parents. We have a small number of clients that are dealing with sperm factor infertility, but mainly what we wanted to offer is for us, by us, fertility care for people trying to get pregnant when you don't have sperm in your relationship. Um, working with us, the majority of what we are going to offer for folks in our care is really excellent fertility tracking. So fertility awareness method so that you can figure out when you're ovulating so that we can time an IUI really well. We're using commercial frozen baked sperm. There was a time when we were able to use, uh, we were able to wash fresh sperm, but the companies that sell the sperm washing medium stopped selling them to midwives, so we can't do that anymore. Um, and it's a good option if people are really down to be involved in the process of the day-to-day, -day, like understanding the way that your body works and understanding your symptoms of ovulation. Um, it's involved. It's a, a daily task tracking when you're gonna ovulate. 
we ask that people do it a few months ahead of time before the actual IUI so that you're confident that like, this is what my body does. These are the things that affect ovulating late or early. Like if I miss a night of sleep or if I travel or if I like, you know, go ham on salt or something so that you understand like this is what's happening in my body so that we can really time your IUI because sperm is expensive. <laughs> um, we also can offer that same fertility awareness tracking for people who have a known donor. So if you have somebody that's local and you're doing intracervical insemination, so basically just like turkey baster method, but you don't actually need a care provider for that if you have somebody that you know. Like we can tell you how to track your cycles, we can tell you how to do your own inseminations, but that's like the, the most DIY version of getting pregnant. Um, I think it's also, we are also a good option for people who are, have different marginalized identities. Like if you're worried about experiencing fat, fat phobia in a medical setting, if you're worried about experiencing racism or transphobia in a medical setting and, and going to a clinic, you know, multiple times a month is going to be a hardship. Um, and you are otherwise healthy and not experiencing any other fertility concerns, then I think the one-on-one -on -one queer for queer healthcare can be um, really validating and, and feel really safe. We offer IUIs at home. So that's also a perk to it is it, it's in your space. So with us, if you're within a half hour of Philly, then we can come to you between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. so that we can do your IUI in your home. And then we get the fuck out and just let you enjoy your space and think happy fertile thoughts. Um, and then wait the two weeks between insemination and when you would take a pregnancy test to see if we achieved a pregnancy. Um, we tell people to think about four IUI chunks at a time before reevaluating if unmedicated at home IUI is something that you're still interested in, or if you're interested in doing a different sort of intervention. You know, like cis heterosexual couples are not gonna get a diagnosis of infertility until they try for 12 months. But for queer people or single parents that are using frozen sperm, that also translates to like 12 to $15,000 of sperm and IUI costs. And so we find that folks in our care might graduate to medicated IUIs a little sooner because cost is a factor, sometimes age is a factor. Like it just, is important to get the ball rolling, like you just want to get pregnant. But in general, that's the, the nuts and bolts of what we offer. Um, talking a lot about like, what is your, your relationship to food and nutrition? Like, where are we starting? What's gonna be realistic? Like there's, there's like optimals for, for what you eat and for healthy ovulation. Um, but I think that especially if you're tuned into like trying to conceive social media, it can uh, turn into like health purism really fast <laughs> and turn into like five optimal foods for ovulation when that's not really where our orientation is. We only maybe want to know like, are you eating? <laughs> are you eating regularly? Do you feel satisfied? Like, do you, is, is thinking about all of this like a, a good experience for you and your relationship to food and nutrition. Like we don't need you to take eight gajillion expensive supplements for ovulation. Like we can talk about what's gonna be realistic for you and your lifestyle so that you stay sane and confident during this process. Cause it can be, um, there's a lot of like different tentacles that can become very intrusive, especially if you're trying to get pregnant for six months. Um, and your mental health is just as important as your physical health in this process. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions so far? I just kind of like blew through a lot of different things, but if anybody wants me to like go through an acronym or, or flesh out something else that I said. Um, I just had two questions. One would be, does it actually hurt? Like it's not really like, intrauterine right like it's just it's through your cervix so the the diameter of the catheter that we use is kind of like the inside of like a big pen oh, so okay. not huge 
And also your cervix does dilate towards ovulation. So it, it is open. Oh yeah, look, Dr. Gutman has them right there. Oh, okay. And it's flexible, it's soft. Um, okay, so it's not like typically painful then, right? Sometimes it's crampy. Um, I just it's, almost passed out when I got my, I, my IUD in before. So that's why I'm very <laughs> nervous. The, the tool that they use to get into your cervix for an IUD, it's metal and the diameter is a, quite a bit wider. Oh, okay. Oh. I think Jackie's uh, mic is oh, off. Oh, she's muted, I think. No, it's it's absolutely nothing like it. And here you can see how flimsy it is, and you can see how it compares. I have big pens. Perfect. So you can see the the difference between the two, and it really is very flexible. It's not nothing like an IUD. Yeah, I think the the most uncomfortable part of the IUI honestly is the speculum you know especially for working with queer and trans yeah. people where you know things inside their vagina is not a welcome experience then that's that that tends to be the more uncomfortable okay. part. if you've yeah. had a speculum exam and that it doesn't tend to bother you then it really is just oh okay well that's good to know. and then my thank you my one other quick question was like do you get to like pick your donor like based off of like you know, nationality, like what you and your partner are looking for, like you kind of go through that process with you guys too? A little bit. Um, you know, it's it's easy to go down the rabbit hole of a bunch of different features and priorities for your donor. So we kind of say like, pick your top three. So if ethnicity is wow. wrong, um, you know, there's far fewer black donors than there are white donors. There's even fewer different variations of other ethnicities. Um, you know, we were working with someone that like was trying for a couple of years to find a Filipino donor. And it took a couple of years to find a Filipino donor in the system that they were using. Okay. And then otherwise, yeah, like your genetic traits, like see if you're a carrier for something, if they're a carrier for something, um, you know, they, you can pay extra to be like, does he have a master's degree? Like what were his grades and whatever? Okay. I, don't, I don't know if that's real. I don't know if it's a genetic. <laughs> yeah. So is that something like your patients like pick with you? Like you with your That's something they usually do. What, sorry, what'd you say, Victoria? Usually on their own. Oh, on our own. Okay. All right. I guess I'll reach out to you guys in the future if and when I do that to figure out where to look. <laughs> so there, there are, I don't know if I'm muted still. So there are a number of different banks out there. Um, we can certainly provide a list of different banks for us. And at this point, I think it's true for all banks. Um, they need to be registered with the FDA. And so um, that's usually uh, pretty prominently displayed somewhere on their, on their website. And most of the websites are pretty user-friendly. Um, if it's something that would be helpful, and this is typically what I do with patients at their first consult, is go to one of the, the, the websites. And I actually use Fairfax just because it's, it's not that it's the only good bank out there, but their website's super easy to navigate. Um, if, if people want to do it, we can sort of go visit the website and talk about some of the things that are actually um, important in terms of selecting a donor and what the different options are. Thank you so much. I had a question. Um, so we've selected our donor. We have a, a donor through California Biobank um, that we want to work with. Um, we know that we don't want to go a medicalized route. So we're kind of thinking between like IUI with a midwife, but we were thinking about trying at home. I heard you speak ICI. about- Yeah, we're um, doing ICI first. Yeah, I heard you speak about um, with no, with a known donor doing that. Would you not recommend it with a frozen donor sperm or? For, so my position on this is that for the cost of frozen sperm, and also there is a decreased likelihood of pregnancy if you're using frozen sperm versus fresh sperm, I think it is worth it to do an IUI with frozen sperm um, because when you freeze them and then defrost them, they just like lose, they lose a bit of the vigor, like they don't live as long. So I think introducing them into your uterus is a good idea. I also have some skepticism. There's um, the, the Mosey insemination tool 
they claim that it's as effective as IUI, but I, I don't know how they can claim that with like in any empirical way. And I, I worry that people are, are spending a lot of money using a tool that doesn't have a lot of evidence behind it and then might not actually be as effective as an IUI. So if you, if you look at the, the likelihood of success, I absolutely agree that pregnancy rate is higher with, with IUI. Um, and, and if you're okay with it, I'll show you a couple slides that sort of get us to that, that point okay, whenever you're, you're, you know, I don't want to interrupt, but I can, I have, I have a slide up that can do that. Yeah, that would be great. Whenever, I don't know if you have anything else to share, Victoria, but I'd love to see that information. Yeah. I mean, I think from, from chances of getting pregnant, I think that like in an ideal world, everybody would just have a known donor that was like down and everybody felt good about it. And, and, and that was the way to go because it's free <laughs> and your chances of getting pregnant are, are higher. Um, and then second to that would be IUI with banked frozen sperm. So um, I promise, and if I forget, cause I'm definitely much older, um, remind me to go back to the, the, uh, the website. All right, give me a sec. I'm gonna, that's my screen to share big. All right, see, you're seeing the, the turkey baster again, right? So nobody uses a turkey baster, but people talk about turkey basters. So I'm gonna, I will get there, I promise. Um, there are a couple of things that we will wind up doing um, again, part of this actually is a function of the fact that sperm is extraordinarily expensive, as, as we will see. Um, and so we often will do egg reserve testing um, to, to see what somebody's egg reserve looks like. Um, AMH is a hormone that is made in the ovary that correlates with, with the number of eggs that people have. Um, we want that to be high, ideally. FSH is a hormone that's made in the brain that drives the ovary. We want that to be low. And this is what an ovary looks like. So you can see the difference between this thing here and this here. And this has a lot of black circles. Those are called follicles. Those are the uh, things that hold the eggs. And once we, they accumulate a fair amount of fluid, we can see them on ultrasound. So this person likely has greater egg reserve, more eggs than this person who may have those two little black circles. And so, you know, at some point, this may be important if you're either A, not, get, not getting pregnant, you've done some, some home vaginal inseminations, or you're a little bit older, um, to be able to, again, you know, help move the clock, as, as Victoria had said, sort of in one direction or another, so that, that sense of, of urgency. The other thing is, when you think about getting pregnant, again, egg, sperm, uterus, and tubes, um, and again, in part, because uh, sperm is expensive, we do talk to, to, to patients about testing their uterus uh, and tubes before doing insemination. And ultimately, in all honesty, leave it up to the patient unless they have a history that suggests that they, they will have a problem with their tubes. Assuming they don't, honestly, the likelihood is that their tubes are fine. This is a test called a hysterosalpingogram or HSG. Speculum goes in the vagina, um, catheter goes here. You put the contrast in and it fills open space and it lights up the open space. We absolutely and without a doubt tell people to take whatever their non-steroidal drug of choice is. And so as much as I said that doing an insemination is nothing like having an IUD put in, most people think this is not, not quite as bad as putting an IUD in, but it is absolutely and without a doubt, Randy. No, there's, there's no question about it. So this is, is one that's normal. This is one that's not so normal. You can see the tube is blocked. And as the contrast is going in, it blows up kind of like a water balloon. So we talk to, to patients about it before we start. Um, and assuming they have no history, ultimately they'll decide whether they want to do this first or try a couple of inseminations before going ahead and, and testing uterus and tubes. Victoria talked a fair amount about timing the insemination and really getting to know your body and getting to know when you're ovulating. And there are a host of different ways to do it. You can use a temperature chart, but it's only good retrospectively. Wake up in the morning, you take your temperature, temperature goes up after ovulation. So you only really know that somebody has ovulated, but it does give you a sense of your menstrual cycle. You can check your cervical mucus. It should be stringy typically around the time of ovulation. 
You can use one of the ovulation predictor kits. They either make a little smiley face or they have a little line. And typically you ovulate the day after that. You can time um, insemination with that. There are a host of different apps out there. Most of the apps really don't do much more than doing a little math for you. So you'll count your, you know, you could sit with a calendar and just count the days between your, your, your one period and the next. And you typically bleed two weeks before the next period. What most of these apps do is they do that math for you. And then they put this little fertile window up to be able to say, this is probably when you're most fertile. And then um, Victoria had alluded to this as well. The other way to time insemination would be with blood work and ultrasound where you do come into the office. Um, typically we see you close to what we presume would be the time of ovulation. We measure your uterine lining to make sure it looks pretty. We look to see the follicle. So you remember those little black circles. Now it's a big black circle. It's not this big, but it's a big black circle. Um, and use that and blood work to time insemination. Or sometimes we, you know, have a trigger shot that you can take that, that causes maturation and release of the egg. So there really are a number of different ways, whether you're doing insemination at home or in the office, to help you time it to, to maximize your likelihood of, of success. So this is, this is the slide that I was talking about. Um, so, so there are a number of different ways to do insemination at home that are not IUI, but rad, rather vaginal. Honestly, if you're doing insemination at home, whether it's with fresh sperm or, or frozen sperm, and you don't have somebody like Victoria, um, don't buy any of these things. Um, they cost a lot of money and there's nothing that suggests that they help. And so you take a syringe, you draw the sample up in the syringe, put the syringe in your vagina and squirt. Yeah, and the um, I'll add to that and that in my experience, especially with, I mean, with any sperm sample that you're using, something like the, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the the stork cap, the, the thought is that if you can keep sperm as close to your cervix for as long as possible, it, it increases your chances of it getting into your uterus. In my experience, using these, unless you're like an adept like menstrual cup user, it makes the sperm come out of your body as opposed to keeping it inside. Like if you're, if that's something that you're used to using in your body, the, the pressure of it just kind of like gets it out of your body. And I've, I've just, I've witnessed too many people like have their heart sink being like, did all of that just come out of my body? And I'm like, yeah, it just did. Um, in all honesty, even if you know what you're doing, because there's data that then this is old data looking at a cervical cap where you essentially put the sperm into the cervical cap and put it up there and the doctor is doing it and theoretically knows how to find your cervix, it doesn't work as well. So I think we, we, we're on the same page in terms of don't, don't put your money there. Yeah. Gotcha. So that's the, it's twice as impactful, but even the cervical cap method is still a medical professional in doing that. Those are two medical professional. Correct. Right. So, I, I mean, and again, this is, this is exactly what Victoria said, and this is just a slide that has a, a, a you know picture. But with fresh sperm, pregnancy rate is is higher if it's a vaginal insemination or with a cervical cap by far. That delta closes pretty dramatically when you are using um, when you're doing an IUI. And so, certainly, again, there may be reasons to do a vaginal insemination with frozen sperm. But you have to know that your pregnancy rate will be significantly lower. Gotcha. Thank you. So it's not that it's it, you shouldn't do it or can't do it or it's wrong to do, but it, it's a significantly lower pregnancy rate. And then just like a, a, a materials note to the, the kinds of syringes that I found to be the most helpful are the teeny tiny one milliliter syringes that are used for insulin. You can get them without the needles. And, you know, like the volume of sperm, if you have a known donor can vary really widely. And so if there's someone that has like a concentrated volume of sperm, it's a lot easier to pull it up and then dispense it if it's a little guy like that, as opposed to the bigger ones where it'll kind of collect at the bottom and then maybe get stuck in the, the edge of it. So, and, and even if you have a few of them to pull up the, the sperm sample, I think the little, the little ones are nicer. And you gotcha. can sort of, I think see the edge kind of there where it can sort of get stuck in a little bit. 
I see. And then working with um, like a wife, uh, Victoria, if we're working with frozen donor sperm, could we have it's like sent to y'all's facility? Um, it, gets sent, it gets sent to your house. So once you get your donor and, you know, like we would cover this all in like a more condensed appointment so that it's, it's fresh in your mind, but you would have it shipped to your house a few days before you expect to ovulate. They send it in this like ridiculous gigantic tank full of liquid nitrogen for like this itty bitty thimble of sperm, but it, it stays frozen for seven days. So it just kind of sits under your kitchen table or whatever until you're ready to use it. And it, it defrosts really fast. Okay, gotcha. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so this, this just kind of looks at the impact of success based on age. And this, this sort of slope mirrors what we showed at the very, very beginning with the older you are, the harder it is to get pregnant. So that um, the per cycle pregnancy rate um, is going to be higher in somebody who is, is a bit younger um, and as will the cumulative pregnancy rate, what's the likelihood of success after six cycles? This addresses the question of whether one should or shouldn't use, use medication. And so one of the fertility drugs that we use is Clomid, it's an oral fertility drug, works by tricking the brain into thinking that the ovaries are not working. Another drug is, is Letrozole or Primera, tricks the brain in a different kind of way. Typically, one uses Clomid with uh, uh, women who have regular, whoopsie, regular cycles, and Letrozole is for somebody with irregular cycles. There was a really nice study that was done where they took uh, lesbian women who were either doing natural cycles, who had had a history of regular cycles versus uh, using medication for the first three cycles of, of insemination. And essentially found that the pregnancy rate was not significantly different in those individuals who were using medication versus those who were not using medication. What they did find is that the multiple pregnancy was dramatically higher, zero versus 11.8%, uh, in those not using medication versus those using medication. And I think the concept of twins in the stroller is absolutely adorable. You can match their little outfits or whatever, but it is a much more risky uh, pregnancy. There's a greater risk of premature delivery. There's a greater risk of, of complications resulting from premature delivery. So typically we don't, if somebody has regular cycles, at least for the first few cycles, use medication because it doesn't seem to offer a lot in terms of uh, positive outcome. So um, cost. Sperm is not cheap. There's no question about it. It depends on where you get your sperm, but it is not cheap. And so um, I had made this slide uh, previously and did smile a little bit to myself when Victoria said that if you're using a friend, it is free. And I would argue that there is nothing in life that is free. Um, there are different kinds of costs. There is nothing in life that's free. And what I, what I would encourage, and, and again, I don't know who's been to what sessions, um, but I would encourage if you are using uh, sperm from somebody that you know, that, that you actually do visit an attorney. Um, and we would, if you're doing it in, in the office, and we do direct the donation in the office, but um, we would require it. But even if you're doing it at home, would, would absolutely encourage you, if you're doing it on your own, you've never met Victoria, you've never met me, um, to meet with an attorney to make sure that everybody's rights are, are protected. Um, oftentimes the insemination is covered by insurance as is the monitoring. If you actually have blood work ultrasound monitoring, um, there are definitely insurance companies that take the approach that Victoria had described. So Aetna, for example, will typically say, you need to have been exposed to sperm for X number of months. And that X number depends on whether you are under 35 or 35 and over. It's a year under, it's six months, uh, 35 and over. Um, they are they are pretty much the, I, I don't wanna say they're the only one because I'm sure that there are other very small ones out there. Um, Independence Blue Cross, which is what a number of people have, will cover without uh, uh, prior sperm exposure. Um, Keystone typically covers without prior sperm exposure. Um, but Aetna, Aetna does not. Um, may I interrupt for a, a question that popped up in the chat? Um, someone asked that about doing IUI with fresh donor sperm. So 
the the acronyms ICI intracervical insemination that's where you just expose sperm to your cervix but don't put it inside that is for fresh sperm IUI so intrauterine where you're delivering sperm into the uterus has to be washed sperm so sperm the the genetic material that gets into the egg belongs in the uterus but the semen itself does not so if you don't wash it it can cause a, an inflammatory reaction it can cause an infection so you were correct maybe i didn't clarify the the terms that i was using well can you see fairfax in front of you is that on the screen here yeah okay so this is the website that I use when I'm sitting down with patients. It, California Choir Bank is great. They make you register. I've never registered. Um, and so this, you can do without registering. And so essentially there are a number of things from which to choose. So we talked a little bit about the ID, non-ID, um, height. So these are all things that you, you decide. You know, do you want somebody tall, not so tall? Um, ancestry, again, is going to be, you know, obviously personal preference, hair color, eye color will be personal preference, education will be personal preference, adult photos, again, will be something for you to pick. Things that start to interest me a little bit more and are important in terms of how you're selecting are going to be um, specimen type and different banks will call it different things. So if you are doing insemination at home, vaginal insemination at home, you've never met Victoria, you want to just inseminate at home, you need to get ICI sperm. It stands for intracervical insemination. Nobody does intracervical inseminations anymore, I don't think, but they're still calling it that. If you are doing IUI, and, and Victoria, tell me if I'm wrong, but if you're doing IUI, with Victoria, you need to get IUI sperm. That's right. If we are doing IUI, we you can get either IUI or ICI sperm. And the reason for that is if it's IUI sperm, we thought we draw it up with our stuff and we use it. If you get ICI sperm, we thought we have to prepare it. So we have to use that sperm wash to prepare it to get it ready to do an IUI, to get rid of the seminal fluid and stuff. If you are doing IVF, which we'll talk a little bit about, but if you're doing IVF, you can get any of the sperm. We just prepare it for IVF. You cannot use IVF sperm for vaginal insemination or IUI, there's not enough sperm there. So then I typically click on advanced search and I, I actually will have patients, and so we can pretend to do it now. I'll have patients click on, no, they don't click on it. They tell me what to click on. Um, and so there are other things, curly hair, not curly hair, whatever. CMV, so CMV is, is what we talked about before. So you can actually sort by CMV negative or CMV positive. Blood type, if, if you happen to be RH negative, it is easier to go with an RH negative donor, but you do not need to. And there's so many other things you're selecting for. Honestly, it's hard to, to, to find donors. And, and again, Victoria had said, you know, in terms of black donors versus, versus white donors, Asian donors, different banks will have a greater proportion of one or the other, but you may have a harder time finding a black donor, for example. And then the genetic testing, so you can have any kind of genetic testing, or if you said, gee, I just want those that had that screening for hundreds of different disorders, you would click on this. And then you click search. And so I went with six feet to six two, identity release, Asian graduate lifetime photos, and came up with two. So then what we do is, um, we click on them and, and ultimately all of the banks, I don't care what bank you're looking at, says something nice about the donor. They are selling you sperm. They want you to buy sperm. So his dark eyes are warm and inviting while the smile encourages those around him to feel comfortable in his presence. I'm sure he's a great guy. So he's a medical student. Um, 
he is CMV positive again. It really is quite common. He likes to play the saxophone. He likes to be in nature. So this guy only has IUI sperm. And they say, please call because he probably doesn't have that much of it. And then this is, this is my favorite. And I don't know that you're going to be able to hear it. He's probably not. Donor 6146 tells us what matters most to him. Uh, I think what matters most to me is, is that people feel like they're loved and have the support. Can't argue with that. Um, and he's had the genetic testing. So again, I mean, it, 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 it will be important as you're selecting your donor, if you're using a commercial sperm bank, truly to play around a little bit and see what's out there and, and see what you're comfortable with. Um, hang on one sec. I'm just going to go to the other guy for a sec. So he has different kinds of, of sperm available. Um, he has the IUI. He doesn't have a lot of the others, but you can see that it is not, it is not inexpensive. Um, my favorite dark fact about capitalism is that sperm banks have sales. Like they will do like Memorial Day sale or they'll, they'll try to like offload specimens at certain times so it is it is worth it like it's it's so expensive <laughs> sperm banks are garbage like they are are profiting off of a very real desire for people to grow families and and they do a really good job at making money about it um so that's just like to to prepare yourself for the like weird fuzzy ethics of of buying sperm from a commercial sperm bank <laughs> Um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen again, screen two, share. So the next thing for me would be talking about IVF. Uh, before doing that, does anybody have, for either of us, obviously, any questions about insemination? Picking I have one more question. Yeah. Oh, it looks like they do too. Go ahead. <laughs> No, no. Go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, my wife and I, we've already tried okay. once uh, doing at home insemination. And um, we also had, she, my wife who uh, was getting pregnant or trying to get pregnant uh, with ins insemination, we um, already did the HSG procedure one time. And so we're kind of wondering, like, is that something we should do again? at some point in the next six months as we continue to try? It was unsuccessful our first time. Do we do it again? Does it last a certain amount of time? <laughs> That's our question. So the answers will probably last a really long time. I mean, you know, obviously if you had an HSG and then, you know, uh, six weeks later, you had a ruptured appendix with a big abscess, things can change. But typically things don't change quickly. And so if it was done and there was no, you know, within the past year or two, and there was no intervening event for you, I would not encourage you to do another one. And then my question was just um, for the difference working with you as a medical professional um, with frozen sperm, do you do the cryobanks ship directly to you? Um, is that process different? Yeah. So the, the cryobanks ship directly to us. Okay. Um, and then we can store the sperm. So sperm is uh, expensive, as we saw. Shipping not so cheap either. Yeah. There's also no way to tell somebody exactly what they're what what's going to happen, right? So the likelihood of success may be 15% or 12%. You could get pregnant in the first cycle or not. Um, so it's it's always very difficult to counsel somebody regarding how many vials of sperm to buy. Yeah. Um, in addition to, and I used to tease Michelle Adi, who used to, to do these, these talks as well, who worked at, at, at uh, Fairfax. Um, I thought they had a Black Friday sale. She still denies it. Um, <laughs> they also sometimes have, if you buy X number, you get a vial free. Gotcha. Um, so there's no, there's no great way to, to decide how many to buy. Part of it is what your resources are. As I tell people, part of it is, how many children do you think you want to have? How important is it for you to use the same donor? Because if the answer is more than one, and yes, we really would like to use the same donor, having extra sperm is okay. 
because you'll want to have it available for later use. Um, so there's no right answer, but the bottom line is yes, they do ship to us um, and yes, we store it. Gotcha. And then um, Victoria for midwife services, um, it sounds like y'all do IUI. Do you also do like midwifery services? Like if, you know, someone becomes pregnant, do you do labor and delivery midwifery as well? Yeah, if people want it, I um, the overlap between people who do this for IUI that then want to proceed with a home birth is, is not as large as I thought it would be um, because having a home birth is a whole other you know, decision that you need to make on if it's right for you. But I, we love it. Like if we have people get pregnant and then we get to catch those babies, it's a, it's a special experience. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, y'all. And we wave goodbye after your early, with a really big smile, mind you, but we <laughs> <laughs> So you only work for conception. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. And then I just had two quick questions. Uh, one would be, because I'm local to Philly as well, like is there local banks or is everything kind of online? So everything is online because online is, is easy to sell and they sell nationally. We do have a local bank. So Fairfax started in Fairfax, Virginia. Most of the big banks will have collection sites as they describe them in a number of different locations. And part of that is to just increase volume and increase diversity. And so Fairfax happens to have a collection site, if I'm not mistaken, in West Philly. So no. one of the things that you can do with Fairfax that you can't do with the other banks is um, you can actually go pick the sperm up. Normally it comes via FedEx, but you can go pick the sperm up. They will give you a shipping container. And before we go, I think I have a container if anybody wants to see it. Okay. Um, and then you have to bring the container back. You, you have to leave a deposit for the container. Um, and they do charge you something for using their, their container as well, but you can, it doesn't have to be shipped FedEx. Okay, that's cool. And then um, my other quick question was, after, is this the next like, se se segment is IVF? Is there anything else after that? Like if I didn't want to, like if I headed out now, like is there anything else after that? Unless, uh, unless you have any questions, there's a cute little picture of the baby at the end. Um, <laughs> but, but really, I mean, it's, essentially it's IVF. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Victoria, I don't know if you have anything you want to throw in. I don't want to scare anybody away. Um, I don't think so. Um, if anybody wants to talk further with our practice about it, you can always go to our website and schedule a 15 minute call to get more questions answered. We're, we're around. All right. <clears throat> Sorry, can I ask one more question? Yes. Um, it sounds like ICI is within what we've tried at home with known donor sperm, like timed well with ovulation already. I guess we've been considering inviting in a midwife into that process. Um, but it also sounds like, you know, using this sort of timing ovulation is also kind of something we can do on our own if we're going that approach. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, yeah, what would the benefits be if we were to have a professional with us? Since it's not IUI, it sounds like it's the same process, right, with the syringe that we're doing on our own. It's the same process. You don't you don't need a, an extra healthcare provider to do that. I think the the benefit that maybe we would be able to offer is to make sure that you're timing your ovulation well and like getting the optimal timing. Um, Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Thanks. This is the tank. It's pretty heavy because it has all of that liquid nitrogen. It's actually not a ton of liquid nitrogen, but it is nonetheless pretty heavy. Okay. So IVF. So when do we do IVF? So there are a number of different reasons why we might do IVF. Um, it might be because um, you've done a number of inseminations, you've done home inseminations, you've not done home inseminations, you've done inseminations in the office and you are not getting pregnant. So unfortunately, you know, intuitively you think to yourself, if only I had sperm, it's, it's, it's sort of like the Wizard of Oz, you know, if only I had sperm, I definitely get pregnant. And the answer is you have a really high likelihood of getting pregnant, but there's no guarantee. And so there are going to be some people who need to use donor sperm who wind up being infertile and wind up not getting pregnant with inseminations and ultimately may come down the path to IVF. Alternatively, it's possible that you would have blocked tubes. That would be another reason to do IVF. 
or you may be at, if you were part of a same sex female couple um, interested in doing co IVF, reciprocal IVF, shared maternity, however you want to describe it, where one person provides the eggs and the other person carries the pregnancy. And the only way to make that happen to go from one part partner to the other would be to do IVF. So essentially for IVF, we, we, we take the eggs out, we put the eggs and the sperm together in a dish, put an embryo back into the uterus. And so typically we use a lot of medications, expensive medications um, to stimulate the ovaries. So normally the ovaries will mature a single egg they recruit a bunch of eggs. So, so in a natural cycle, you have a bunch of eggs that are like waiting to be told what to do, but only one of them really gets the call. What we do if we're doing IVF is we use medication to try and, and save those, those uh, eggs that would have otherwise gone to the wayside to stimulate growth of all of those and, and have more eggs that are then available to be used. The medications, you can see this, this little needle here and there's a little needle here and there's a little needle here. The medication is all injectable medication, unlike the medicine I talked about before, which is oral medication. Typically it's daily injections on average, about 10 days worth of the injections. And then you have the egg retrieval. We monitor your ovaries to watch the eggs, the follicles grow. So previously I showed you a picture with one black circle. Here's a picture with a lot of lap circles. And that really essentially is the goal is to get multiple eggs to grow. And so we, we monitor you with blood work and ultrasound. And again, we see you quite frequently. So we usually see people after three days of medication, blood work and ultrasound, maybe two days later, blood work and ultrasound, maybe a couple of days after that, blood work and ultrasound, maybe the next day, maybe the next day, maybe that you're with us a lot. The visits are pretty quick. Um, if you're not comfortable with a vaginal ultrasound, we can do an abdominal ultrasound, um, but you're here with us. I think we're nice, but you're still here stuck with us. Seemingly Amy Schumer needed to do IVF, and this is, this is Amy Schumer uh, after her egg retrieval looking a little buzzed. So um, it is typically an outpatient same day procedure, um, IV sedation, so you are sleeping. If any of you have had your wisdom teeth pulled, it may be the same kind of medication. Um, most of you are probably not in, in of the age where you've had a colonoscopy, but it's the same kind of medicine as you get there as well. Procedure itself typically takes about 10 to 15 minutes, can be a little longer, can be a little shorter, depending on the number of eggs that you have. The recovery time, we, we would keep you with us until you're able to eat a little cracker or something um, and keep down some liquids. Usually it's about a half an hour to an hour. Risks are bleeding, infection. There's a risk of entering the bowel, the bladder, the blood vessels. Likelihood of having a problem is going to be really small. So looking at a sort of cartoon-like, there's a probe that goes in the vagina, needle goes into the ovary, and then we actually, we step on a pedal that creates suction that sucks the fluid out and the egg goes with it. And so this is actually what it really looks like. Here's the follicle here. The fluid is black. We can't see the egg. This is the needle. We suck it out. We move to the next one, suck it out, and so on. This is one of our embryologists looking under the microscope for the eggs, and this is what the eggs would look like. This is actually the egg itself. This stuff here is, are the cells around the egg. And then if you look at the egg itself under the microscope, um, it looks like this, and then this is the sperm that's surrounding it. You need fertilization to occur. You take the, the egg and you surround it with some sperm and you hope that fertilization will occur. And this is what a fertilized egg looks like. And this is the nucleus from the egg, nucleus from the sperm. Sometimes when we're using frozen sperm because the fertilization rate is a little bit lower, we will use what we call ICSI or if there's a problem with the sperm where you use this, this fancy equipment using joysticks and stuff to be able to pick up a single sperm, inject it into the egg. So you can see the, the needle going into the egg there. It deposits the sperm and then the needle leaves. And again, we come back and we look at the embryo fertilized egg. This is what it ideally looks like at about three days. This is typically what it would look like, assuming it's developing nicely, five or six days. Um, this is what becomes hopefully embryo slash fetus. 
This is what becomes placenta. And then here we can see the shell, right? We've seen the shell all along. We see the embryo starting to hatch out of the shell. This is called a blastocyst. This is called a hatching blastocyst. And this is, this is really a very beautiful looking embryo. And that's the kind of embryo we would like to transfer. So we talked about the impact of age and the fact that, that unfortunately it does make it harder to get pregnant. And the reason we think that that occurs is the older the egg is, and this is the age of the egg essentially, this is the percent of embryos which are chromosomally abnormal. So the older the egg is, the greater the percentage of chromosomally abnormal embryos. And so what the impact of that then is, whether you're doing in vitro fertilization or whether you're having insemination, is that the pregnancy rate is lower and the miscarriage rate is higher. And so one of the things that we can do is we can do genetic testing on the embryos in, in individuals who are doing IVF to screen out those chromosomally abnormal embryos to help us pick the best embryo to go back first. Again, when we, when we talk about shared maternity, the only difference is going to be that the egg comes from one person and the uterus comes from somebody else. But the concept, the medical processes are the same. They're just happening to two separate people. And this is what an embryo transfer looks like. Um, and you know, legs, unfortunately, in stirrups, much of what we do involves legs up. Um, and this is what it looks like actually when we do it. So there's an ultrasound on the belly. We do want to have a full bladder because it helps us see. We can see our catheter going into the uterus. And this is, this is air that, that is near the embryo. Um, we can't see the embryo. It's microscopic. But that's what we see when we do an embryo transfer. This looks at the likelihood of success using IVF in the country in 2019. And again, we see the impact of age such that the live birth rate is almost 50% less than 35, 35%, 35 to 37, 22%, 10%, and then greater than 42, unfortunately, quite low. And Jackie, what is the, what's the BMI cutoff at RMA right now for egg retrieval? And so I yeah, for egg retrieval, it's 45, and that's a function of anesthesia. And so we need to be able to safely manage the airway. And so our anesthesia team has a, a BMI cutoff of, of typically 45. There are small exceptions to the rule, but typically 45. Um, in terms of cost, it is, it is obviously not inexpensive. And when we talk about insurance coverage, much less likely to have insurance coverage for IVF than for um, IUI, it is going to be employer dependent. Um, there's medication costs, there's medical costs. Um, and then if, if it is co-IVF co because we're treating two separate people, it's a little bit more expensive. And ultimately, as, as you might imagine, the goal obviously is to have a healthy child. The baby pick was worth the wait. The baby, baby's pretty cute. No question about it. Um, Somebody had a question about medications uh, and when do you need to stop medications? And, and the specific question was migraine medication. And ultimately it does depend on what the medication is in terms of starting medication. So there's some meds that are very short acting and it's not an issue. And that typically is actually migraine medication. Um, there's other medication that, that, that takes longer to clear the body. And so that may need to be stopped in advance. Um, and typically for any medication, there's an issue of, as, as with anything else, risk benefit. And so, you know, I, I had a patient years ago who, who unfortunately was bipolar. She had been hospitalized three times, once with diagnosis, twice when she came off her meds. Lithium, which is what she was using, is known to be teratogenic. It, it is absolutely without a doubt associated with birth defects. And despite that, the plan was to keep her on her medication. And the reason for that was, though there was absolutely risk with the medication, the risk coming off the medication was far greater. 
So typically it's going to be a, a very specific assessment of what drug somebody's on and, and, and whether they should continue, shouldn't continue, and if so, when to stop it, which was probably a longer answer than anybody wanted. Um, so we have a client who is the most incredible insurance whiz, like she got everything reimbursed and she gave me a few things to, to consider that she discovered. So if your health insurance is an FSA or an HSA, a lot of sperm is, is FSA or HSA eligible. As long as you get a letter from whatever provider you're using, then you can usually get that reimbursed if that's your insurance situation. Um, if you are working in a clinic, they have the ability to look at the sperm to make sure that like the motility is good and the count looks good. We don't have that. Like we don't have the microscopes to look at that. But if you get a sample that like the sperm are not viable, then you can get a refund on that sperm. So that's something that is, is only available if you're using a, a fertility clinic to do your IUIs. Um, some sperm banks have pregnancy pledges where they will refund you a certain amount if you don't become pregnant in a certain amount of tries. That might be contingent on you doing the like buy five sperm vials, get one free. So you're fronting them a good amount of money. But if you don't get pregnant within those, some sperm banks will reimburse you. Um, Going back to sperm banks, if you buy, let's say you, you, you think you want to have like four children and you buy 20 vials of sperm and you've now spent $25,000, and suddenly, you know, you, you get pregnant really quickly. I um, mean, you, you don't need to use all of that sperm. Most of the banks, not all of the banks, most of the banks will buy the sperm back from you at 50%. Mm -hmm. So they'll resell it. It, it cannot have left their, their building. So if it gets shipped, for example, to us, they will not buy it back. But if it does not leave their facility, um, they may buy it back at 50% Just something to keep in mind. Um, I wanted to say something about a couple of things that come up sometimes, um, about, you know, like the donor of your dreams, not being local to you and the different options for that. So if your partner's brother lives in Colorado or whatever, and you really want to use it as your donor, but the distance is an issue, <clears throat> you can do something called directed donor where you freeze and store that person's sperm in a sperm bank and then they ship it to you. That process takes a long time because they have to quarantine it and do all the things that Jackie talked about that the FDA requires. And so that, that requires planning in advance. It's not my favorite method because it's really expensive. And then enough, if enough time goes by, like sometimes they have to re-quarantine it and sometimes they ask you to pay more things. Like it just gets, it's, a, it's, it, it's an expensive process. Um, some people have been doing this fresh sperm delivery service. I think it's called like home direct or direct to home donor <clears throat> where they're using this, uh, the similar tools that they use for like cat animal husbandry where they ship the sperm on like an egg based medium so that they can live and then overnight it and then have fresh sperm for an ICI. No studies, no information on how effective this is. I know of one single person that has gotten pregnant using that sperm. It's like a couple hundred dollars. So there's, there's lots of different options, but that's one thing that comes up every so often of like, what happens if the donor I really want is not here? So um, what, there is some data looking at something similar to that. So years ago, before we had that ICSI thing where you picked up a sperm and injected it into the egg, when the sperm was really not good, we, or if somebody had a collection problem, so they couldn't on demand essentially provide a sample, um, we would have them collect the sample the night before have it stay in media, literally have it sit out on the counter. It wasn't as good as a fresher sample, but it typically was actually pretty good. So there, there is, is some data that, that, that looks at it. I don't know anything about, about uh, makes me think of food delivery and fresh direct, but um, I don't know anything about it, but, but there is some reason to believe that though perhaps not ideal, it is, it is doable. We've, um, one of the things that we've struggled with is finding medical providers that are like actually LGBT inclusive, um, particularly ones that are also like, trauma-informed, 
Um, so should we not be able to use like a midwife service for an at-home birth? Um, are there uh, recommended OB-GYNs or medical providers for like um, delivery that are, are known to be good with working with the community? The midwifery practice at Jefferson in Center City is the practice that we use um, for transferring the, the staff of midwives themselves are like pretty overwhelmingly queer, which is just like a, a coincidence. Um, also, there are like queer and queer friendly midwives at Abington, but Abington as a hospital, I haven't I haven't had very good experiences with the way that they practice care. So I would start with Jeff if you're going with a hospital. Okay, fantastic, thanks. I will also tell you that they've done a fair amount of, and I, I again, I, I don't know anything about delivering babies, but um, they've done a, a fair amount of work in trying to, to make it a very inclusive environment in the hospital in terms of um, training and that kind of stuff on labor and delivery. Um, you know, I'm sure that, 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 you know, there are patients who have not had the greatest experiences, but I, you know, I, I think that's going to be the case anywhere, but, but they have done a lot of work around it. Is there anything else that anybody wants us to clarify? Thank you so much, both yeah, of you. Thank you. This is really and I'll, I'll tell you times more helpful. <laughs> chat in case anybody has any questions that pop up. Just want to make sure I typed right. And I didn't, not a surprise. I'm also going to stop sharing um, in case anyone wants to ask a question off the recording. <laughs>